Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lara Villama. I am the head of outreach and community experience here at the Framingham Public Library. Thank you for joining us so much on a rather warm December afternoon. We're thrilled to see you here. Uh, a few quick announcements before we get started. Uh, we are thrilled to feature today Roman Rudnitsky on piano. And of course, a huge thanks to our sponsors, the Roche Brothers Supermarket, Metro Credit Union, St. Mary's Credit Union, Middlesex Savings Bank, Brookdale Senior Living at Cushing Park, and of course, the Friends of the Framingham Public Library. Your donations, memberships, and contributions to the Friends help make programs like this possible. And of course, a huge thank you to Bill Rapkin and his team for, tonight, for today's assistance in filming the concert. And with that, we'd like to welcome to the library, Roman Rednitsky. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Very, very glad to be here again. I was here a few years ago. Nice to be back concertizing, you know, period, you know, because all of us performers were idle for quite a while, about 18 months. I started already in September. I played in Cleveland. I had a tour in Missouri and Kansas in October. I was in Alaska last month. I had five concerts there. And next week, I'm going to be off Christmas, New Year's on the Queen Mary on a Caribbean cruise from from New York to five or islands and I'm giving four concerts. So it's nice to, that things are already starting to resume. I know it's still a transition period, but uh, at least something is happening now. So welcome to today's concert and I'm just very briefly, we'll say a couple of short words about each of the pieces, uh, give you a tiny bit of insight uh, to what you're listening. The first, um, uh, the piece regarding the first one, Tre Dances by Manuel Ararte, composer, you probably may not have heard before. He was, he's one of the, was one of the foremost composers from Guatemala. I've, I've been down there several times with performances and got to get to know s several of their composers. And he's a fine composer. And this is one of his finest pieces, written in, in the early 1950s. Three dances, very short, interconnected. Very, the first and last one are very vigorous with repeating patterns. And the second one has, is more restrained with kind of interesting bitonal harmonies. We have two keys kind of clashing against each other. So, Tres Dances are three dances by Guatemalan composer Manuel Erarte. Thank you. 
Thank you so very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, a lovely piece of Brahms is Ballad, number, uh, Opus 10, number 2 in D major. Brahms, as you know, uh, the last of the three big Bs, as, as sometimes said, really considered to be Beethoven's foremost successor as a symphonic composer. And a lot of his music has a kind of a, quote, symphonic, unquote, sound, meaning lots of chords, vertical structures of sound, rather than running passages. You find that through piano music, chamber music, concertos, and so on. Very straightforward, sober, serious kind of music. You know, in the Romantic era, which is the 19th century, pretty much, composers could be quite different from each other, but as long as they share, you know, feeling and expression, uh, and a kind of a fascination with the beauty of sound and how to manipulate it, they are considered romantic era composers. But they could be quite different. You couldn't find someone more different than, for instance, Brahms, the conservative, at a time when composers, some composers were going into really new areas, even radical areas, like his contemporary Wagner. I mean, it was really shaking up the musical world with his music dramas. But Brahms stayed conservative. And very much in the Beethoven tradition, and when someone pointed out to him that his music sounds like Beethoven, he said, any fool can see that. You know, he was very, very open about it. Well, among his many compositions, he wrote what, a, a number of shorter piano pieces, and he wrote four pieces called ballads, which make up his Opus 10. And this is the second one. Very lovely piece, very peaceful beginning, a little more agitated in the middle, and then it reverts to the very quiet, peaceful thing and ends, and ends very quietly. Very typical of his, of his shorter pieces.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, the next composer is one of the, of course, one of the most uh, significant composers from from Britain uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century. Benjamin Britten, uh, quite prolific composer, known for several operas, lovely work at Christmas time called Ceremony of Carols, uh, a number of other things. And he hardly, he didn't really write piano music, even though he was a pretty good pianist himself. He, he, in his earliest years, he did it. But in his mature years, this is really his only real work. He wrote a short piece called Noturno, or Nocturne, around 1963 for a competition. That's about his only other piano piece that's around. This one dates from 1934. Um, in four sections, kind of a portrait of a time at, on the English uh, uh, seaside, an English seaside resort. And that's why the titles uh, are what they are there. And that first one, early morning bathe, starts in a kind of a very fragmented, jerky sort of way, and then it goes to a kind of a very jolly, rollicking theme throughout, and ends very, very strong and, and abruptly. Very beautiful lyricism in the second one as it starts sailing, but gets a little agitated in the middle. You know, maybe the water's getting a little rougher or, or something, you know, it's just a change in mood, and then it reverts again to the peaceful thing. Then you have fun fair, again, very, uh, lots of finger work in that, uh, changes mood here and there, and ends extremely strongly. And then the last piece, extremely slow, extremely quiet on the subject of night, which he did several other compositions on that same, on that same subject. And it just kind of drifts away uh, kind of hum, blended harmonies and so on and dies away very quietly. This is really his only important piano work, his only work really, and uh, one almost laments that he didn't write more for, for some reason. So Holiday Diary by Benjamin Britten.
Thank you so very much. Thank you. Transcriptions and paraphrases uh, were very popular in the turn of the uh, 20th century. Uh, many pianists play these kinds of pieces, arrangements of things from opera, from symphony, from other sources, and you know, make the very effective and dazzling piano pieces out of those. And um, uh, uh, these kinds of pieces were programmed by a lot of performers in those days. We very seldom hear these kinds of pieces now, nowadays, but they are, they are really very, very nice to listen to, and especially if they're well written. And one excellent example is this. Uh, this transcription, that, which Rachmaninoff made of Bach's prelude from the Partita number no. three for unaccompanied violin, it's a, it's a very well-known theme, and it's a perpetual motion thing. Beginning, I mean, it's one of, one of the most challenging things for violinists, you know, uh, any of those unaccompanied works of Bach, and uh, but Rachmaninoff, you know, made like, a very intricate arrangement for piano. Uh, so you'd say that the melodic and thematic material is Bach, but the pianistic treatment and the harmonies are Rachmaninoff. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, another lovely transcription here. You know, Gustav Holst's The Planets, great orchestral work, is one of the most frequently performed orchestral pieces by any 20th century composer, um, written during the World War I years, uh, in seven movements. Of course, each movement titled after one of the planets. But what Holst was doing there was focusing more on the astrological rather than astronomical meanings of those planets. <laughs> Japanese composer Katsuma Nakajima made a very nice transcription of the second, well he did, uh, he actually transcribed the whole set, but this is the second one, 
Venus, the bringer of peace, one of the most sublime and loveliest pieces I think ever really written. Beautiful woodwinds, soft woodwinds, strings, harp, you know, these kind of soft instruments in the original. And I think that Katsuma Nakajima really captured the essence of this, of this uh, work very, very nicely. So this is his transcription of the second movement, Venus, the bringer of peace, from Gustav Holst, The Planet.
Okay, now we come to uh, a very muscular piece, the Ninth Hungarian Rhapsody of, of Liszt, Franz Liszt, uh, one of the greatest pianists of his time and probably of all time, and an extremely prolific and very innovative composer in his time, and uh, the first great show, showy performer on the piano, because he modeled himself on Lee, the person who was the first great showman, and, and that was Paganini, Niccolo Paganini, the violinist. And he was just as overwhelmed as anybody else when he heard Paganini, he heard him in 1831 in Paris, and he resolved he was gonna do the same thing for the piano. So there are many pieces that kind of showcase that, and that was kind of the beginning of what I sometimes refer to as the golden age of virtuosity, mid 19th century onwards. And among his many pieces, he wrote 19 Hungarian Rhapsodies. Um, they're not melodies of the Hungarians, but of the Roma. We used to be called gypsies, the Roma that lived there. It's a different ethnic group. I mean, what we now call ethnomusicology was not yet around, so, but that kind of research came later. So that's what these, are, these really are. And they're sectional in form, and um, uh, they end you know, in a very muscular manner. And they're simply referred to by their number. So number two is the most famous one, probably the most famous piece, you know, everybody knows that, you know, ta -ta 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 -ta, that one, you know, that's number two, the end of that. Uh, this one is one of his bigger ones. It's called, uh, subtitled Pester Carnival, the Carnival of Pest. You know, the, one of the twin cities that makes up the Hungarian capital, Buda and Pest, both sides of the Danube. Actually, Pest is a larger part. It's, I think it's two thirds of the city, really. So this is what this is, the Carnival of Pest, the ninth Hungarian Rhapsody of this. <laughs>
Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the concert. I enjoyed doing this for you.